open your, the list and just uh, give you a chance to see, uh, to speak, or to just type in the chat really, really quickly. Oh, oh, Val, you're here. Sorry, we were just waiting for Val to come back. So I'm going to give the mic over to Val Alexi, the executive, the executive director of URLC. She's going to introduce our speaker for today. Good morning. Welcome to everyone from across the province and our region that has joined us this morning. It's great to be in a school site this morning, and you may be able to hear the announcements in the hallways, so my apologies for that back channel talk. Um, before I introduce Michael, I'd like to just see a check from all the participants across the province that are engaged with us this morning. If you have ever heard Michael speak, or if you have ever read one of his articles, could you indicate to us with a happy face? Thank you very much. Would you also indicate to me that Michael probably needs no introduction at all. We have a short time together and just before we let him go we're going to do a little bit of a roll call. Would you indicate for me whether you want to give him a round of applause for all of his work that he's done, all of the writing he's done, the speaking that he's done, and helped us in our work in school improvement. So thank you. As you can see, I don't think Michael needs an introduction. We're thrilled, Michael, that you're willing to join us today. If it's okay with everyone, we would like to start with a quick roll call from districts and we'll start alphabetically on the participant list. If you wouldn't mind sharing the name of your district and if there are more participants with you from wherever, you're, uh, wherever you are right now. So Bev, I'll let that, um, if you wouldn't mind starting with that introduction. Hi Jen. Hi Jen, it's Bev from G Sacred and we have um, about 20 people on our list. Not everybody's here but uh, we've got um, at least a dozen or so, so we're glad to be here from St. Albert. Uh, Bev Millibar, thank you. Hi, yeah, Bev Millibar from Elk Island Public Schools. There are four of us here. Hi, Hi I'm, I'm Carolyn and, and from uh, Sassanol. I'm, I'm alone. And just saying thanks. And the next one, after Caroline, is Chantal. Who's at your site, Chantal? And you can type it in the chat or you can speak it in the microphone. You can see Chantal typing in the chat. So we'll go down to Coaches as Change Agents, the mysterious Coaches as Change Agents. Can you jump on your mic and say hello and say how many people at your site, please? Hi, coaches. Which site are you participating from? You're the only one? Okay. Um, and we've got Jen. I think Jen said she was alone at her site. Jose? Oh, thanks yes. for typing it in. PSD, they have a half a dozen facilitators and a step student. Awesome. Jose, hello. Hello. Hi, this is Jose. Uh, we are four. We're from uh, Greater North Central Francophone Board. Welcome to both Jose's. And I think uh, Kate has told us previous. Well, it says Kate Belford 3, so I'm not sure if that means there's three people. That's correct. There's three of us from Canadian Rockies Public Schools. Welcome, Canadian Rockies. Hello, Paula. How many people at your site? Paula, you can just type that into the chat. Um, I know that we've talked. Um, Parkland has said they've got a half a dozen people. Um, welcome all the way from Yellowknife, coaches as change agents. That's awesome that you could join us today. Um, Sandy, how many people are with you today? Uh, we've got seven sitting here, all bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. <laughs> That's just excellent. Sturgeon, can you top that? Uh, yeah, we can definitely top that. We have 12, uh, including our superintendent, an associate superintendent, a couple principals, special ed coordinators, vice principals, and central office. That's wonderful, thank you. And um, Therese, how many people over at MERFIP today? Eight, bonjour, MERFIP, eight members. Great to be there, awesome. And uh, thanks, thank you everyone else for typing in the chat. Vicki?
Okay, we're going to assume that you're all by yourself. <laughs> well, thanks everyone. And Belle, did you? No, just thanks an awful lot for joining us. And thank you very much, Michael, for willing to do this after your recent travels. And we'll turn it over to you. Okay, thanks very much. And uh, hello to everybody. So um, I'm just going to make about oh, 12 minutes uh, beginning presentation. Um, many of you know that <coughs> excuse me, I've been working in Alberta for the last, especially the last three years with uh, superintendents and uh, several of you will have been at the session recently at Rimrock that Ben Levin and Lynn Sherritt and myself did. So we're pr very happy to have this ongoing connection with the whole province basically. And uh, secondly, just by way of also background information, I know you've been connecting with Jim Knight, who's a, a colleague of mine from uh, Toronto from the old days when he was just starting out. And he and I just did an article for educational leadership. I don't know whether it will be accepted, but I'm not, I'm not actually going to talk about the inner workings of that article except to give you the title that will convey what uh, my mess our message is. The title is Squandering the Efforts of Coaches. So Squandering the Efforts of Coaches. So this is... Uh, this is really basically saying it doesn't matter how good a coach is if they are um, if they're not in a school that doesn't have a, an instructional leader as a principal, if they're not in a district that's working on the reform agenda in the way that we know works, if they're not in a province that has a good context, their efforts are going to be blunted. <clears throat> so I'm going to present with you, and I just put these slides together last night, so they're not uh, a couple of the slides you have seen before, but I tried to put together these uh, eight lessons, I call them, that are the most uh, recent things coming from this that I think will be helpful for you and then we can talk about them. Uh, we use, as you know, this term the last uh, 16 months, uh, motion leadership, to connote the idea that uh, motion leadership is about uh, causing uh, positive change to move forward, whether it's turning around an individual, a school, a school district, or a system, it's all of those. So that's, that's kind of the lead-in. I won't get too much background, but many of you will know from 2008, The Six Secrets, that kind of captured what we had learned and I tested it with the business literature. So again, I won't go over that, but it is relevant background because these ideas came from practice and they were tested out in the literature. Uh, these, since in the last uh, four years or three and a half now, uh, these products, four of them are the most recent the motion leadership booklet itself, the skinny on change we call it, uh, the movie, a bit pretentious of a title, but it's, uh, it's the uh, filming of eight uh, instances of success, six of them are districts and two of them are states or provinces, the all systems go, which is province wide or whole system reform, and most recently moral imperative uh, realized, which uh, I'll get to in some of the lessons. So let me get to these lessons right away. And these are a distillation, as I said, I think of the most important insights about change at the operational level that you as a change agent can use uh, and relate to your own experience or that you can um, also, in helping others develop, focus on these things. So I'll just do them one by one. Uh, all effective leaders combine resolute moral purpose and impressive empathy. Uh, that We've, for several years now, written about moral purpose, so that part has been clear for a while, but what's become clearer at the uh, operational level is what I've come to call impressive empathy. And impressive empathy is when uh, you have empathy for someone else who's in your way. That's why it's impressive, uh, because you'd rather not have them in, in your way. So a lot of our change work, of course, is about building relationships. And so point number one I want to make is you really have to be good at not just being right about the agenda, but figuring out where other people are coming from. And this notion, I mean, Dan Goldman's empathy is, is certainly central here, but I want to push it one step fur further and call it impressive empathy, <clears throat> because you really do understand, uh, you get to understand, you have that knack, if you're good at this, for understanding where others are coming from. The second and related one is kind of a corollary, I guess I'd have to say, is we've noticed this in situations of, like say, toxic cultures, which have been turned around significantly uh, over two or three years. We've written about some of these schools and some of these school systems. In every case, uh, if you have a, a, a negative culture or a not a good culture, 
you will find people who uh, are not that happy, right? And so, uh, and they've learned in their daily work, I'm going to say, um, not to be all that respectful to each other because they're really not having um, a positive culture. So in order to turn that around again, and this is a variation of impressive empathy, the way I put it in a kind of a rule of thumb way is at the beginning especially, you have to give people more respect than they deserve uh, because they won't be knowing you, they won't be acting in a different way. Uh, we wrote about uh, Crosby Heights and a really toxic culture that Ryan Friedman, the principal, turned around. He was respectful even at the beginning when, they, uh, when the staff wasn't because there was just another leader coming in. But it's not just respect, but it's respect plus capacity building, plus plus as we've seen in all of these. So very, uh, uh, very important part of impressive empathy is this ability to show respect to others uh, based on uh, the need to uh, sort of find out more where they're coming from. The third one of the eight <coughs> is uh, I've come to appreciate what I call realized moral purpose, the emphasis on realized, <coughs> and, the, and I call it the best motivator. And what this means is that, and I want to revert, I'm doing this on purpose to do, uh, uh, turn around the, um, the uh, uh, causal relationship. Normally we think of get moral purpose uh, uh, you know, stoked up and then people will implement. Now what we're realizing in many cases, especially people that haven't had reason to feel that success is going to happen, is that you actually have to help cause success and then as a result of that, their moral purpose is activated. Maybe it was buried and it had to be resurfaced. Maybe it wasn't there much in the first place, but once they see the, the fantastic ability to impact kids, it, it, it gets stirred. So um, this, is, uh, this is an important uh, change agent skill because it means uh, don't worry about getting uh, the lack of progress at the very, very beginning. Keep doing some of the right things. Get it to kick in. And then when it kicks in, take advantage of the new energy. And then the fourth of eight, uh, the notion that when you work together, and we've seen this time and again in every situation, this is teachers working with each other within a school. These are clusters of schools working together in networks or districts for that matter, is that two big social forces happen. One I call mutual allegiance. One sense of identity gets enlarged and deepened across bigger uh, uh, scenarios. And then the second and very uh, interesting and, and appreci uh, you know, something to be really appreciated is when people are moving to get things accomplished they never accomplished before, there's kind of a sense of uh, collaborative competition that kicks in which really helps people stretch. And it's friendly competition, let's call it. Sometimes I call it moral Olympics. But it's that kind of excitement that you really are accomplishing things you, weren't, you never thought were possible. <clears throat> so those are the first four. <laughs> the, the second four, success is a matter of changing the culture of the school. Uh, so uh, we all know this, but I want to put the, it's not in implementing an innovation only, it's realizing that the culture of the school, the culture of the school is the way that people work together, for better or for worse. The values, the habits, the skills, the, uh, the issues about uh, the practices and, and so forth. Uh, I put in a little corollary here because one thing that's really clear in the, the practical evidence is that the principal is obviously clearly important for the culture of the school, but more than that, the principal has to participate as a learner in helping the school move, move forward. So for example, a principal who sets up uh, uh, a PLC <coughs> focus who provides resources and time for people to work together, but himself or herself does not actually participate in the learning, would not be an instructional leader in our books. So, the, but it is the culture of the school, the principal is key. Uh, second, and this is <clears throat> easily missed because of the focus on schools and not realizing the district context, we're also talking about success, and this is in our, our sessions we've had with the, uh, with the superintendents, that it, we're talking about changing the culture of the district. This is not a school by school change. This is a whole set of schools in the culture of the district that's really key for this. And, uh, and that we should realize that. And that culture changes so that, and again, we've written about this, we work with districts to help make this help happen. And what you see is that the achievement of the whole district on the average, whether it's 15 schools or 200 schools, goes up. Uh, graduation rates go up over a three to six year period. And that's because the, uh, the leadership of the district and the leadership of the schools, 
Both of those are important. They need to work in partnership. They need to, uh, a, a, a commitment to peers across schools, but also a new we-we relationship between schools and the district. And then the um, second last one, I put it this way, uh, effective change agents exploit state policy. Uh, by that I mean province policy. And I don't think of province policy as something literally to be implemented as if it's somebody else's agenda. But I do think of it as something that you really have to um, uh, understand, take into account, be part and parcel of. And if you, if you take the notion of exploit in the best sense of that word, you will find very good goals and strategies in state uh, province policy. And you have to be knowledgeable about that policy. You have to know that priorities. You have to be uh, an, an example of the priorities in action. So it's again, this is a win-win notion because we've got this, uh, every element of the system, this is systemic after all, which means every element of the system has to be in the purview of the uh, coach as a change agent. And then as a final che checklist to make sure, sure you're on the right, uh, right side, I'm going to say of the wrong drivers, this will become clear in the next slide. I just did a um, paper, uh, an article for a group and the article is called On Choosing the Wrong Drivers for Whole System Reform. <clears throat> it's on my website, uh, michaelfullen.ca, on the home page, so you can download it uh, right from the home page. And here's, uh, I took, I wrote it for a group in Australia and they asked me to concentrate on um, uh, examples where uh, there were the leadership of a whole country was trying to bring about serious change and that uh, they were uh, actually proactive about it. And, uh, and what, was, what was right and what was wrong about how to do that. So I looked at Australia, which was the group that uh, commissioned the article, and I also looked at the U.S. where we're working quite a lot. And if you look at this, and I, I have to be brief on this because the article gets into the, 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 the depth of certainly our discussions, you can. But those countries, U.S. and Australia in particular, and I, I give the examples in the paper, uh, the ones that um, are in a hurry, I guess I'll say, or don't appreciate the right drivers in quotation, tend to uh, uh, overemphasize accountability instead of capacity building. Capacity building is, uh, uh, is uh, learning. It's building up the competencies and skills. So they, they err on the side of accountability, which means testing, uh, merit pay, um, other things that really focus on uh, checking up on things and, and getting uh, data. The second thing, uh, that's related to that, which is the second wrong driver, is especially in the U.S., they tend to focus on the, what I'm going to call the individual solution. So if we could only get more top-notch principals, if we could only get more high-quality uh, uh, teachers, uh, which is relevant, of course, but when you look closely at all the powerful strategies, it's really teamwork that's the winner. Uh, the, that is groups of people. The whole PLC foundation is built on this premise. And the evidence is actually overwhelming if you look closely, even at the last 40 years, time and again, it's those uh, collaborative cultures that win every time. A collaborative culture is group work, it's not individual work. And then the third one is um, uh, the importance of having instruction drive technology rather than the other way around. And technology is seductive, as we know. It's, uh, it's sexy. It's got all kinds of uh, bells and whistles. It's, it's, it's fabulous in many ways, but it also, it can look like progress if you have the latest uh, equipment, uh, but it's not a progress if you don't have instructional improvement. And then the final one is the, um, the, um, the, the, the need to make it systemic and not to keep going for pieces, accountability here, uh, individual quality of teachers there, uh, <laughs> curriculum over here, and you, so you need to get it um, connected, I guess I'll say. And we have positive examples of that. Uh, the work, uh, the high performance of Alberta is an example of, of probably the right drivers at work. More explicitly in Ontario, Ben Levin and I have, have written about this, him in his book on changing 5,000 schools and me and um, All Systems Go, for example, showing how we, how we use the right drivers, although we didn't use that language at the time. Uh, so that, it's, that, that's, uh, it's a good checklist because it really is the eight lessons, if you go back to those, in action on the right side of the drivers. <clears throat> and then um, just a, a final uh, slide here. Uh, the culture of learning is everything. Uh, so that the single greatest difference, I'm going to say, between effective and ineffective 
organizations, whether they're schools or businesses or <laughs> multi-unit organizations, uh, systems, is the shared depth of understanding among people about what they're doing. Shared depth of understanding. And you can't get shared depth of understanding from a workshop. You can't get it even from sending a team to a workshop. You have to get it by what we call learning is the work, which is actually secret number four. So learning is the work is the centerpiece of this. But when you say learning is the work, I mean two, when I say it, I mean two things. One, it is the day-to-day -day experience of people. And secondly, it's collective. It's team-based. It's the group learning game. So those, that's a quick, I, I know many of you have heard me or read the book, so I didn't want to get into a long-winded uh, review of that. You can read more about it. But this is my, uh, my uh, short uh, uh, 11 slide reminder of, I think, what is the latest, what's coming out of this work. And I'd be very glad to get your reactions about whether this rings true, uh, what questions you might have, what things I've omitted that you want to talk about. Anything goes in the next half hour. So over to you. Thank you, Michael, for that overview. And you're right, uh, lots of opportunities to read your good work, to listen to your messages. And Jan's added your website address to the chat room. I am struck by, as we provide districts time to um, think of the questions they'd like to pose with you, because this is a beautiful opportunity to have access to one-on-one, -on -one, so to speak. I appreciated the uh, wrong versus right drivers analogy. And just to try and make a, um, an alignment with our work in the province, the accountability versus capacity building reminded me of what someone mentioned about the essential conditions to support implementation that's available. Jan will type in the website address. That, that whole uh, guide is based on a shared responsibility. And someone mentioned it's almost like a, a collaborative accountability framework that we want to address all the conditions to really support the capacity building we want for the system. How do we really focus on the implementation? The individual versus group work, there's some great work being done by the province right now around collaborative practices. And we'll add that website into the archive material. There's a little um, a bookmark that um, has been developed that actually is useful for districts and groups to look at. How are we modeling that collaboration? So teaching us about how to be collaborative. The technology versus pedagogy reminds me of the work that the region and the province is doing around the TPAC model. And some of that information by chance just happens to be on the front page of our website. How the pedagogy needs to drive the, the um, strategies that we use in classrooms to support uh, systems or to support student success. And the last one reminds me of piecemeal versus systemic uh, change. There feels like, and what we talked about at the Leading Our Way Forward uh, session with the superintendent's panel, is there's multiple priorities, initiatives coming together. And our districts and our region, uh, we've um, asked us to, how do we connect all these dots? How do we make it a system change versus all of these initiatives that come forward? So I appreciated the wrong versus right drivers that you suggested there. I'm not sure yes, Sorry, just wanted to, that was a very good summary uh, and overview. I wanted to make two comments on it. Uh, one is that we, we do find that people have too many priorities. This is part of the piecemeal problem, uh, but that the sheer number of core priorities. So uh, we've, and when I say we, I'm thinking of Ben Levin, myself, who have really been the most uh, influential, at least in Ontario, in shaping the agenda. But a small number of core priorities that are elevated above others so that the sheer number is not the problem. That's one thing. The second thing is that quite often, and I say this in the Wrong Drivers paper, it will look systemic on paper. So I know the essential conditions, for example, because uh, we, we went over the copy uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the essential conditions paper, for example, it looks, looks systemic. But, uh, and I don't doubt that it's intended to be, but my question always is, does it feel systemic to people that are implementing it? Not just can you make the case that it's uh, cognitively systemic by reading it, but can you, uh, the way it plays itself out, does it really uh, operate in a connected way on the ground? And I think that's a much tougher criterion to meet. So Sandy has brought forward a question from Graham Prairie um, on behalf of his team. And it is, if you're hiring a learning coach, what would be the top three qualities or experiences that you would look for? So what past practice represents their 
future performance, Michael? Um, yeah, I would. Uh, first, I would look for uh, what they can describe as their actual work. Um, a lot can be found out just by whether people are vague or specific. So in one sense, it's what is their track record of instructional practice. So that, that would be one overall criterion. The second one is I would want to know um, how steep they are in instructional um, pedagogy. That is, uh, do they really know their stuff when it comes to uh, for example, the for embedded formative assessment, uh, instructional practices that are, are, are working. And the third one, and very important I think, is uh, do, are they aware of the school improvement and district improvement uh, side of the knowledge base? So we might find uh, instructional coaches that are uh, steeped in pedagogy but not very cognizant of the uh, the, the wider knowledge base that on school improvement and professional learning communities. So I won't, would want to uh, know whether they are plugged into that, whether they're conversant in it, whether they read that stuff and agree with it and engage with it. Uh, so, um, so all of those things. And I guess a fourth, uh, you, did not, you didn't ask for a fourth, but I'm going to throw a fourth one in, uh, is whether, um, is how respected uh, these people are with their colleagues. I don't mean a popularity contest, but uh, are they are they respected by uh, for their uh, their moral commitment, for their expertise, for their interpersonal qualities, uh, and the more that they're respected by a diverse range of of other people, I think that the you know the more the, the more telling that that is. Thank you, Michael, for sharing this. This is Val again. Alberta Education has provided a summary based on Joel and Killian's work of some of the roles that learning coaches may undertake. And we appreciate your summary as well as that the Leading Our Way Forward where districts are making decisions about what are those aspects that we want these uh, folks to uh, take on. The list that currently is on the website and from some of the literature is much longer than three or four items. But I appreciate the conversation around what are the KSAs or the knowledge, skills, and attributes that these folks uh, need to have in their back pocket. I'm also intrigued around the conversation around are there some of those knowledge and skills that we can teach, that we can help and build uh, learning coaches' capacity? And would, how would you respond to that? Are there some things that we are teachable? Oh, well, yeah, to, to me they're all teachable. Um, I just did a new book called Change Leader. It's only in page proof sense, but I, I went over this change leader. Are good leaders born or, or do you develop them? So um, I mean, uh, virtually um, all the things we're talking about are teachable. I'm sure there's on the margins, uh, you know, 5% who get it fantastically well without much effort and 5% who will never get it. But for the other 90%, we can all learn it. But we also know that the learning must be experiential and cumulative so that the famous rule which has a lot of truth to it that it takes 10 years of uh, purposeful learning to become good at something. So this is why if I'm going to interview somebody for, for a, a position of this nature, I want to know what they've done the last 10 years or if they're only in the system for five years, what they've done the last five years. Uh, so that uh, another way of answering your question, if they haven't already dis, uh, demonstrated that they're a learner by what they've done, then I would worry. But I wouldn't say it's because they're hopeless. I would just say they haven't been doing the right learning things to get to get that to get that development. So it's uh, most of the writers uh, keep saying this is um, not impossible work, but it's hard work. You have to apply yourself. And you have to go through the learning curve and get better and better at it. And it's going to take a few years uh, of staying at it. So Sturgeon's question is, how would you advise learning coaches to be working more elbow to elbow with their colleagues? Uh, I, I think any, uh, uh, depends what the particular sort of uh, arrangements are, but if you think of uh, coaches, um, working you know, with uh, with uh, schools, you want to build in um, opportunities for coaches to learn from each other. So those are you know some models have been 
coaches spend four days a week uh, applying, you know, working in schools and the fifth day learning either individually or in combination. Uh, in our, our, our literacy and numeracy secretariat, which has over 100 people in it who are in effect coaches, we call them student achievement officers, but we think of, uh, of it in two ways. One, their main work is definitely to work in partnerships with schools and districts, but their other work is to learn from each other. So we do, uh, I do uh, maybe four uh, <clears throat> workshops a year with them as capacity building and in it. It's not just me talking, I'm pulling out what they're learning from each other. They also build it in in other ways to, to do that. Another way of adding it, because once you brainstorm in this, you come up with your own ideas, is to have um, <clears throat> uh, coaches, some people shadow other people for a day, and, you know, just to, or, or the team do, to do something as a twosome rather than a onesome. Uh, so the, anything those micro examples as well as the larger collective get-togethers, you don't have to overdo it, but you have to in the course of the year say, do we have a few opportunities, uh, some of which need to be collective and others need to be one-on-one uh, -on -one to learn from each other, and do we value the learning from each other? Have we committed as our own norm that we're going to learn from each other? Because if you're not learning from each other, you're unlikely to be very effective in helping other, people's learn, other people learn. For that, Michael. Now, going back to Grand Prairie, they commented that the process and timeline for implementing learning coaches in a school is a challenge. So, what would you recommend to districts who are contemplating a learning coach model regarding a start from central team or would it be a start from a school embedded model? Uh, this is a tricky one. Um, because the answer is neither in a sense. It's neither top down or bottom up. So, uh, so this, it's the, there's really two questions in, the, in it as I'm looking out in the chat um, box. But one is, if I'm, if I'm thinking of starting, I guess I'll say, I would, I would, my first thought would be not to err on either end of that problem. So uh, the one end to err on is to say we better get the central office staff uh, you know, in you know, up to speed before we extend it to schools. I wouldn't do that. Uh, I, I also wouldn't do that, say that this is site-based management. Therefore, we should have the individual schools work at this. So, uh, and we've done this with school districts many times. So I'm speaking from my experience. We at, uh, we steadfastly avoid every, either of those two extremes. Instead, what we might say is. Uh, we would say that this is a partnership between schools and um, and this district office. That if it's a very large system, we can only uh, we only want, we don't want to start all at once. Uh, when we started York Region with its 140 elementary schools, we started with 40 schools, not 140. But everybody knew that it was uh, it was coming uh, coming for everyone, so to speak. <clears throat> so we phased it in according to our capacity. So I think it's important to establish the spirit of partnership in two senses. One is between the district and the schools, and the other is among schools, that that spirit and that norm be established, that value be established right at the beginning. And then you start to go about maybe partial implementation or full implementation, depending on, on what's involved. Uh, and then the other part of the question, I think I'm just going to interpret it this way, is that I think it's important, and it seems a bit strange to put it this way, is to realize you're not implementing a coaching model. That's not the main point. That's a means to an end. So, uh, for example, we saw this in the early stages of PLCs, especially in the U.S., where a district would say, we're a PLC district, and their whole raison d'etre about that was to implement PLCs, per se, as an end in itself. Uh, so PLCs are only a means to changing the culture of the school. A learning coach model is only a means to changing the culture of instruction. So it's in, uh, this, in this sense, it goes on forever because uh, you're just, if you're using a learning coach model, uh, you're, you're establishing, and it takes a bit to establish it, but the, the way of working, which includes coaching, is, uh, is, is meant to be permanent. It's meant to be a, a, a permanent change in the culture. And, and I've expressed it uh, one way in some of the writings that we've done, which is to say that the coach, in a sense, is a second change agent at the school level. The first change agent, I'm thinking of the primary, uh, elementary schools, the first change agent should be the principal as instructional leader. 
<clears throat> but the uh, the additional leaders, coaches are very much part, and this is why when we say squandering the efforts of coaches means that you have a coaching model which is not integrated with the overall leadership of the, of the system. So to see them as part and parcel of that, as second change agents, as uh, as representing a new way of working in the district that's going to become permanent in terms of a culture of learning, I think is an important way of uh, establishing that right at the beginning, that that's the nature of the change. Thanks for that, Michael. I'm looking in the chat and Jose from one of our Francophone boards asks, how do you get coaches? And Tricia, right underneath is, do all teachers need to be coached? Excuse me, okay. Um, um, yeah, it's good to take these two together. You can't, and on the reluctant question, you can't cause, you can't make people change, especially if, if they have tenure. We, we've tried that, so it doesn't work. So you, um, you really do, um, uh, you need to be uh, patient with those that are reluctant. There may be some extreme cases where the person shouldn't be a teacher or they're so bad that, that they should leave the profession. So I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the 80 to 90 percent in the middle. Uh, so that you can't force it. It's important not to force it too, um, too readily. And I'll, get, I'll tie it into the second question in a moment. Uh, but the way to, uh, to get it is to, I think, uh, get people in a situation of trying something in relatively non-threatening circumstances and, and build on it, uh, to get them linked to other peers. Uh, there's a very important overlay here, which uh, we, we call non-judgmentalism, and that's a very big skill to develop. It's in motion leadership. Non-judgmentalism is when you're trying to improve something and your attitude towards what you're seeing is not pejorative, is not negative. Even though it might be ineffective, you and we, we ourselves, I think, have trained ourselves to say, if somebody doesn't have the capacity, it's not because they're deliberately trying to do something wrong or whatever, or we don't roll our eyes at it. We just say, this is a matter of figuring it out and getting some uh, skills developed. <clears throat> so the attitude is key here about how you approach the reluctant uh, uh, teacher. Uh, on the second related one, do all coaches, need, all teachers need to be coached? Uh, the answer to this is a um, definite yes, and I, I, by, by that I mean the definition of a teacher that, uh, of, as a new professional, and this, ha this is applies to all professions actually, that I want to uh, use and, and not be um, indirect about is this. Uh, every it's no longer acceptable for a teacher to say, I'm a great teacher, leave me alone to teach behind my classroom door that instead of that, the definition of a teacher is this, includes this, that every teacher has a responsibility of helping other teachers learn and, and has also an equal responsibility of learning from others. And coaches are part of that, uh, of that combination. So if teachers are particularly good and they don't need coaching in the narrow sense, they can be fabulous resources for other teachers. But the teacher who is a loner, even if he or she is very good at their teaching, I mean, we can all appreciate the, uh, the odd, uh, you know, the person who's a fabulous teacher and everybody thinks they're eccentric but fabulous, and I, I don't want to have a you know, cookie cutter mold here, but, uh, but I also want to say that uh, if those teachers, uh, if teachers, so to speak, are so good to be coached, they, they, they better have an attitude that they can be helpful for other teachers. When they're helpful for other teachers, they learn more themselves. So I think all of this is part of that uh, fabric of changing the definition of a professional to uh, that the professional is an interactive, we're talking about interactive professionalism, not independent autonomy. Thank you. Um, Kate Belford's group is asking, which, what recommendations do you have for a school district with limited funding to support time and people for this initiative? Uh, yeah, it's a good, uh, a good question, a perennial one um, that, um, I, first I don't want to think of this as, a, uh, as the front end question is a matter of time. It's not a matter of time, it's a, it's a matter of norms and priority that, um, and that when you get to practical time questions, as you know, uh, on Learning Forward, the NSDC site, they have a, they have a whole section on how to find time 
in uh, Rick Dufour's, uh, in his group, uh, their book, uh, uh, which is called Raising the Bar and Closing the Gap. Uh, they have a section called Frequently Asked Questions, which is how do I find time? So I think, uh, I think it's the attitude towards time as, as doing this uh, that is one of the issues. And uh, I, I guess I would look for ways of finding time that don't necessarily cost new money, uh, don't necessarily cost new money. Uh, and that uh, there's, you know, cause there's some of the districts uh, that I know because I sat with them a couple of weeks ago in Alberta, uh, they've worked out various things with the community of uh, early dismissal now and then or built in where there's some small blocks of time, uh, none of which cost new money. Uh, secondly, when you get uh, AC type money, as you have, and I know it's been cut in half recently, but uh, that, that enables you to get pockets of time. Uh, thirdly, uh, t um, uh, there are different ways of staffing, of getting uh, students together for, uh, for some uh, group work and, uh, and other kinds of issues. Sometimes principals teach because they want to teach once a week to free up two teachers. So I think it's, uh, it's up to the profession inside the school with help from the district and help from uh, the province to, to uh, address this problem. And we know that uh, school leaders and school teachers who want to uh, get time to work together, figure out in multiple ways how to get small pockets of time to be able to uh, do this. And so I don't want to externalize it as if we don't get time, we can't b become collegial, we can't become collaborative, because that's going to be self-defeating. Thanks again. Um, Beth Baker Hoffman's group from Greater St. Albert Catholic has asked, um, I think that you've probably answered their first question about the role of administrator and coach matching and conflicting. If you think your question's answered in that respect, Bev, will you put up a happy face? But further, uh, further, they're, oh, sorry, further they're asking, do you feel that coaching is best done by an individual or by a team at a school level? Uh, I'm going to, I still want to address the first of those two questions because in my comment about non-judgmentalism, I'm unequivocally saying we don't want to split the development role and the evaluation role. You absolutely do not want to split. You want to uh, redefine it so that non-judgmentalism and school improvement and therefore uh, administrators and, uh, and coaches, coaches always match in that definition, are always congruent. And once you separate them, you get a complication that you can't overcome for continuous improvement. And the, the question of the coaching is best done by an individual or by team. Um, <clears throat> I, I, don't, I, think it's, I think it's done best by an individual, if I, if I gave a literal answer, but then the, the, the team part of it has to be uh, Part of uh, part of this, the culture of the, what the school is doing. I'm thinking of a very interesting parallel finding here, and I think that will illustrate this. Susan Ward Johnson from Harvard, who's done some great work on uh, the teaching profession, and uh, she was looking at mentors in this particular case. But she found that in schools where there was one-to-one -one mentoring, but no collaborative culture, the impact was not positive. But in schools when there was one-to-one -one mentoring but also a collaborative culture, the, uh, the results were multiplicative, if I can say that word. Uh, they, they just uh, they, they combined and interacted to generate more. So uh, if you do, we do it with an individual, and I think that's where the best help comes from, it better be part of a concerted effort of a collaborative learning culture for it to have its impact. Thank you. Now, Parkland School Division, whom I know that you met in Banff recently, Michael, has a long entry in the chat box that you might want to refer to as I read it out, but they're saying there are so many possibilities that the coaching program can be, and they're talking about how do we narrow our focus so it meets the needs of our teachers? How do we begin since we don't have any learning coaches right now in schools? Our learning services department is asking, how do we establish the coaching program in our school division? What steps or priorities should we start with, something that is supportable and measurable? Should we narrow our focus to a specific area, such as differentiated instruction, or are we leaving out something? 
what do other school divisions think that are participating today? And Michael, what do you think? Okay, so this goes back to my question about don't search for a coaching model. Uh, this is not the name of the game uh, in the same way as we don't want people searching for PLCs as if they were a solution in a literal sense. So that I want to go, uh, instead of starting with that question, I want to step back and this gets close to their specific areas question. Uh, I mentioned the importance of, of uh, focusing on a small number of core priorities. Uh, then this is where this comes in. Uh, yes, you should start with a specific area. And if the, <coughs> although I, I don't necessarily like differentiated instruction as an area because again it begs the question for what, uh, we tend to think of uh, literacy, numeracy, um, uh, you know, in high, high school graduation, personalization of, uh, of learning. So I, I think the, the answer then I would give is this, just to organize the answer. One is, Focus on the instructional improvement you want, regardless of the solution for a moment. What is the instructional improvement? Do you want to improve literacy? Do you want to improve uh, in a high school the nature of uh, instructional practice uh, that's more personalized and more effective? Whatever it is, uh, get, get that as your front end um, piece. And then secondly, how are you going to do it uh, needs to involve uh, uh, some form of capacity building to get better at it. Uh, that capacity building, you could call it coaching, but it doesn't have to be called coaching. It could be, uh, it could be, uh, you know, teams learning something. It could be people le uh, learning from each other, cross connections, and all of those things. Uh, when we did this in York Region, uh, that they, uh, <clears throat> and I guess I would say that almost all of the systems I can think about, perhaps all of them, eventually have literacy coaches. If we're talking about literacy, because you need the second change agent, you need more ability to influence it. But I, as I said, I wouldn't start with, uh, with looking for a coaching model. I would look for two things. What is our instructional priority? What should it be? And secondly, how are we going to get capacity building help? And when you get to the second question, you start to think about the coaching connections. And um, Beth's team has asked for just a little clarification around the first question of admin and coach. So can an administrator who is in an evaluative role also be a learning coach if there's not someone else available to be a coach in the building? So in other words, can they serve those multiple roles? Uh, yeah, let's uh, try that one again. Um, we. Um, The, the, when I say principal as instructional coach, I mean that they are, their, their biggest uh, prior, priority is improvement, not evaluative feedback per se. So I can't see how you could, if the principal is going to be key to improvement, I can't see how you can reduce his or her um, coaching improvement role. Uh, it's far more important than the, the mere evaluation role, I guess I want to put it that way. So it depends on the system. I, if you're in a certain system in Texas, for example, or Florida, and you have a punitive evaluation system, then I think there's a problem. But if you're in Alberta or Ontario or British Columbia, uh, that it's, it's, I think it's very reconcilable to be an instructional leader with a primary focus on improvement and still uh, uh, where appropriate uh, deal with the evaluative side of it. The evaluative side is small, uh, is a very small part of the of the role of a highly effect, effective uh, organization. I think. And I'm just going to exercise a little wait time here while we have a few people typing in the chat. So I see Sandy's got something that um, he's going to add. Bev says thanks. Well, we're waiting for some of those uh, other questions to come forward. Michael, thank you for this excellent overview of some of the components we need to be aware of as we support the capacity of our system, whether through a learning coach model, instructional learner model, or whatever. As we wrap up the session, or just before the next questions, we'll add some additional materials in the PD resources on the ERLC website and send that link to everyone. But I'll let Jan go ahead with Sandy's question. Oh, Sandy's question is, do you agree that the coach's prime objective is to work with teachers and not to address the needs of specific students in the classroom at either end of the learning spectrum? 
Uh, I would say absolutely, without question, absolutely. Uh, the only thing I would add is that <clears throat> the uh, the coach has to be also good with students. In other words, has to have that uh, that you know that uh, that specific knowledge that they can do it themselves. I mean, I, when I think of Barry Bennett, who's uh, many of you will know because he's worked in Alberta so much. He had that uh, great, great ability to be primarily a coach and support for teachers, but he would also take over a class anytime with specific students to demonstrate something. So, so that's the answer. Uh, you have to have the capacity to do the work with specific students and demonstrate that for credibility and for clarity. But you have to realize also that that's not your don't you know don't think that that's your main work. Your main work is doing that in order to influence teachers. So it's the teachers that are your main clients, so to speak, not the students per se. Uh, thanks, Michael, for that overview as well. If there aren't any further questions, we'll watch the chat box for a moment. Um, thank you for highlighting for us that it's about our instructional priorities, and really it's about how we align and connect the dots of all the multiple initiatives and agendas that are coming forward from multiple places, our communities, our ministry, and from different areas as well. But really focusing on our instructional policy priorities to ensure for um, student learning. The definition of capacity building or the term that you've used frequently is capacity building does highlight one of the agendas we see from the consortium, from the regional um, consortium perspective, is the term learning coach sometimes is causing some um, angst around districts. How does that term learning coach um, be used and how is it defined? Who's defining it, I guess is what I'm trying to get at. I appreciate what you said that whatever the term is, learning coaches, it is about building the capacity of the entire system and the role that that person will play to do some of that work. Um, are there any other final questions just before we wrap up and provide a round of applause for Michael? Jose? Oh, thank you. Um, thanks, Jose. We'll send you a link out. Um, uh, we'll send a link out for the Learning Forward document that uh, Michael referred to in the DeFore document. We'll send a couple of links and then we'll follow up with some of the information that's been shared here as well. Could you please join me or Michael, would you like a final comment before we say our final thanks? Oh, I think Beth has one last question. Uh, Beth's last question is, um, and we'll end with this, how do you effectively coach teams of teachers and EAs? I, I don't know enough about the uh, the actual role of EAs in your um, in your schools, whether there are lots of them or a few, whether they're dwindling in numbers or whether they many of them see EAs as a route to uh, to uh, becoming a teacher soon or not. So I I think you know uh, if we take 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 EAs as needing instructional effectiveness, then uh, we need to coach both teachers and EAs, sometimes perhaps individually. All the better if they actually are a good team, then working with teams is perfectly fine. And thanks, thanks very much again. I'll just, sorry, I got that. Yeah, I just wanted to thank you. The questions were great. I always learn a lot from the questions. So thank you very much for the session. I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much, Michael, and we really, really enjoyed it as well. And uh, if everyone could join me from across the province with your round of applause, you can see all those hands shaking and across the province and in Yellowknife. And in Yellowknife. <laughs> Thank you very much. And we'll look forward to trying to access some more of your time in the future, Michael. I know that we have a number of sessions listed on our program book that may be of interest to participants. Um, Jim Knight will be back in the new year, the new school year. Laura Lipton will be here as well. And there's a number of archive materials where we'll add this as well. So thanks again, Michael. Continued success in your work. Thank you for your continued writing and authoring. We look forward to continuing to learn from you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.